begin my talk which is for the next 15 to 20 minutes and i'm going to talk to you about exploring this nexus these connections that gut the gut microbiome has with the non communicable diseases the micronutrients and some more things so hopefully we we'll get an overview on the subject not able to move my screen for some reason just give me a moment so um can i i don't know whether you can see my next screen which is showing you the microbes which are all over our body and yes yes now we can see now we can see. yeah so it's i'm going to talk about the gastrointestinal tract because these are the most influential bacteria although the ecology differs from different parts of of the body but we talk about the gi tract today because they are the most influential and they harbor this unique ecology which we will talk about so when we look at connections we know that the evidence is getting stronger and the first exposure to the gut microbiome comes from the mother and how we are born whether it's it's a normal delivery vaginal delivery or a c section whether we are bottle fed or breast fed all of these things play a big role in how the microbiome is going to be established and the first 1000 days are important as ever but what is really helping us is this omics technology which is genomics proteomics and many others which is helping us understand this connection that we have with the gut microbiota and the host it gives a lot of data short period of time unbiased and we can make great analysis from this so ai is helping us a lot to understand the gut microbiome we know that the connections of the gut microbiome is almost everywhere it's it's like spreading its tentacles everywhere and why not there are so many microbes within us more than 100 trillion microbes and not just their genetic material but also they metabolize much more than the human cells so obviously there will be connections everywhere and what what is influencing the gut microbiome is the host physiological condition the standard of living the sanitation the sleep exercise and of course the diet there are many fascinating discoveries happening all the time just like we earlier thought the placenta was sterile but now it looks like it has a microbiome of its own and it seems like it's different in successful pregnancies versus the not so successful one so great insights are coming in but it's a very complex field so the progress can be slow but there are discoveries taking place all the time and the complexity is also really really stark so there's been an exponential increase in the publications in this area of the gut microbiome and rightly so there's so much to study but we know that there's a link with almost everything we do our digestion metabolism brain development immunity allergies how drugs are bioavailable and also the micronutrients i want to talk a little bit about the micronutrients because it's not often talked about so uh, i will uh, talk a little bit about the micronutrients we can we know this that these gut bacteria synthesize many vitamins for us and they uh, they are important for the overall vitamin status of the host they aid in digestion and absorption of fat so hence they are also affecting the fat soluble vitamins not just the water soluble ones but the fat soluble ones because of the bile acid metabolism that they play a role in so it's not just the synthesis it's also the metabolites that contribute towards the host nutritional status and 
All in all, one can say these common cell microbes, they play a role in the biosynthesis, modulate solubility, absorption, and bioavailability for the host. This is a very nice review paper, and we have a lot of hidden hunger in our country. So it's good to see how we can increase the bioavailability of minerals and vitamins through the gut microbiota. And this is, this is uh, probably the way forward. We can change diets, we can also supplement, but also increasing the bioavailability becomes an important factor. This is uh, a little diagram which will show you that in different parts we know of the intestine, whether it's the duodenum, jejunum, ileum or colon, different vitamins and minerals are being absorbed and the gut microbiota, the microbes also, they metabolize, they contribute towards the host micronutrients status by increasing availability and solubility. So great benefit to the host coming from them. So what happens when there is a micronutrient deficiency? How do these microbes behave? Each species, it has been studied, they undergo different changes and it could be a change in their gene expression or their metabolism to cope with these shortages. Everybody has, every species has their own unique response, just like we as individuals have unique responses, whether it is to an external stimuli. So micronutrient deficiency makes these species undergo changes. And if it happens in the first thousand days, these deficiencies of micronutrients, they could be persistent impaired maturation of these gut microbiota and their composition can change leading to disease and increased risk of disease. Because these lack of nutrients, micronutrients can disrupt the numerous functions of these commensal bacteria, change the gut environment and increase the risk of disease. This, this shows you because we talked about how it's connected to health. We also need to understand that how gut is connected, the gut microbiome is connected to disease. And you can see these non-communicable diseases all having links with the microbiota. These are established. More than 25 diseases have been established and more and more links are being seen towards how gut microbiota can increase the risk of disease. When we're talking about this risk of disease, I just want to spare a minute and talk about the new link that seems to be emerging, not so new, but it is uh, the favorite area of research in the gut microbiome, that is the gut-brain link. And we see that there is a communication system existing between the gut and the brain, and there is signaling happening between the two organs. It's neural, hormonal, and immunological signaling. And we already know that the intestinal microbiota and its metabolite have this role to access the brain and vice versa. So obviously the brain will affect the gut and the gut will affect the brain through its metabolites. And we also know now that microbes are releasing some neuroactive substances which are called psychobiotics. And these are being studied for bolstering the athletic performance, the sleep patterns, and for mood disorders. So the gut microbiome is proving to be involved in the psychological homeostasis via the neuroendocrine system. This depicts very nicely that the brain we always knew can influence the gut microbiota. When, when one is uh, going in for an exam, we know how we feel queasy, the motility, mucin production, all of this changes. So the brain is affecting the gut. But new information about how the gut is affecting the brain and directly its metabolites are influencing the central nervous, nervous system is something new and it's it's a very important area of study. Let me tell you that the gut is 
an ecosystem it's it's the entire environment that is important so it's not just the microbes but how they interact with one another another with the host with the entire environment will decide the health of the ecosystem and decide which species can survive in that ecosystem and i want to emphasize that there is no one healthy kind of microbiome that this is the one and we all need to achieve that kind of healthy microbiome there are many stable states that are possible and in a stable state what is the important thing is the balance of the intestinal flora and as much as possible to mitigate any dysbiosis when you look at this figure you can see here that the lactobacilli and bifidobacteria we want them to be in large numbers which it is and you can see the potential benefits of these uh, micro uh, these species of these lactobacilli and bifidobacteria they have many benefits but you can see on the red side that there are certain harmful bacteria as well they have potential harmful effects the idea is not to wipe them out completely just like in politics you need a healthy opposition in the gut you just need to keep them in check it's not that you should only have the healthy ones but they need to be kept in check so what happens when there is disease and dysbiosis the probiotic or the common sal bacteria are far out numbered by the pathogenic bacteria or the um, microbiota which overpopulate the gut so that's when this biosis happens so the balance is tilted in favor of the pathogenic ones so just to give you an idea of state of the gut microbiota which happens with disease but but the definition is so subjective i told you there is no one healthy state so how do you identify it there are many factors which need to be known about identification of this dysbiosis it's the scale of the disturbance the magnitude the proportion of the microbial community affected so uh, all of this needs to be taken into account to understand how this viruses is happening but if i were to say that what is the pattern if you have to tell somebody what is the pattern for gut dysbiosis so although there is no set pattern but you can say that there is expansion of the anaerobic proteobacterium phylum and these are all low butyrate producers like the salmonella and the pseudomonas but the healthy microbiome are the obligate anaerobes and they produce short chain fatty acids particularly butyrate is of great significance so when we talk about butyrate it's important because it plays many roles in improving gut barrier function affects the immune reactions and you know it's not just in the intestines but in very distant organs and tissues and it also has a role in appetite and energy homeostasis and it is actually energy 70% of the epithelial energy is from butyrate so that's how important it is so why are we facing so much dysbiosis it's because of the antibiotic overuse that's one reason and you'll be surprised to know that just 3 days of broad spectrum antibiotics can reduce butyrate levels by four folds and they reduce their ability to form the short chain fatty acids from the fiber the gut barrier function is compromised and the microbial diversity is affected all of this happens with just Three days of broad spectrum antibiotic. The other reason for the dysbiosis happening to us is lack of exercise. It's hard to believe, but there is enough data to show whether it's in animal models, cross section studies, or longitudinal studies. All of them are saying the same thing: that there is when you exercise, there's more microbial diversity. more short chain fatty acid production and those species which produce butyrate increase so there is uh, no kind of disregard for uh, keeping your habits 
very very healthy in terms of exercise you should be exercising and you get multiple benefits from that Excuse me, Nalanjana, ma'am. Can we just take a pause because uh, some participants are saying the video is not uh, available, so the okay. tech team is getting that sorted. We'll just give them a minute. Yeah, sure. You want Sorry. me to? You want me to uh, hold on? Not go ahead, right? Yes, ma'am. If any of the participants are unable to see the video, uh, the tech team has requested to just log out and log in again, and you should be able to see the video. Yes, apologies, ma'am. Please continue. Okay, thank you. So we talked about how antibiotic use, sedentary habits, are reason for dysbiosis. There are other reasons, and that could be uh, host-mediated inflammation, infection, psychosocial stress. We are. we saw the link with the gut but most most commonly seen today is the faulty diet and when you say faulty diet that's a very vague term so i i've tried to sort of specify what that faulty diet is the intake of ultra processed food in excess very high fat diets low fiber diets excess alcohol intake use of artificial sweeteners and emulsifiers which usually come with ultra processed food but there is one aspect of the faulty diet that's not commonly talked about and so i wanted to talk about it is the uh, loss of seasonality in our diets we are no longer eating according to the season and this was a study done in the hatsa hunter gatherer the tribe and their microbiota would reflect the microbes according to the season and this is not happening in our populations and clearly we are losing that diversity so i wish we could eat seasonally and not eat mangoes through the year so we need to stick to seasonal foods as much as possible and diversity of the micro uh, bio is is also being understood that this is increasing if you have loss of diversity there is a risk of chronic disease so we need to eat seasonally and we need to exercise we need to uh, not have antibiotics if we don't need to so all of that is important uh you can see on this slide the more diverse the diet the more diverse the microbiota and diversity on the plate and also in the gut matters so we should strive towards diversity at both places and if you do it on the plate it's likely that it will happen in the gut so what happens when there is this biosis and i have tried to sort of put down some conditions and we can come back to in detail if we have the time but like in malnutrition there is increased prevalence of certain pathogenic bacteria like the proteobacteria and firmicutes in the fecal samples in obesity and diabetes there is higher proportion of firmicutes versus bacteriodites so i want you to uh, sort of just make a note of this because this higher proportion is very important and the ratios become more important than just numbers so similarly this kind of change in the microbiota has been seen in inflammatory bowel disease and autism colorectal cancer allergy asthma and even non alcoholic fatty liver disease now they are using microbiota based therapies and probiotic interventions and fecal microbiota transplant all of this to to get better results so that is how important the microbiota is linked to disease this is just a depiction of what i said that whether it's inflammatory bowel disease or the metabolic syndrome you can see change in ratios 
there could be intestinal permeability problems when there's more intestinal permeability it leads to systemic inflammation so similarly in all these conditions you can see that the microbes are playing a big role whether it is their signaling or the competition where the pathogenic bacteria are colonizing more so all of them have have some scope for the microbiota to be sort of uh, changed and that is how we are looking at various aspects which can make that change there is a hypothesis which is called the leaky gut hypothesis all of you must have heard about it so this is this is what is the increased intestinal permeability which is one of the factors which is proposed causing disease and this is leakage of these substances from the gut into the blood stream and these toxins bacteria whatever that should not be going into the systemic circulation reaches there and the immune response causes more inflammation and this contributes to the health conditions you can see when the junctions on top of this figure when the tight junction is maintained the barrier integrity is maintained and there's no leaking but when the when there is a leaky gut you can see that many components get into the gut and that leads to more inflammation when it enters the circulation so that is the leaky gut hypothesis what is interesting to note that the gut microbiome we think that it is acting only in the gut and causing obesity but what is interesting to note at all levels in the body whether it is the epithelium where it increases the permeability in the gut or whether it's the muscle where it decreases the fatty acid metabolism and right to the brain where it decreases satiety all of that is responsible for causing obesity and that is what more and more data is suggesting when you look at this diagram so it's just the step by the approach and when you see the high fat diet increases intestinal permeability uh, the lipopolysaccharides enter the circulation cause inflammation insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome and predisposes you to obesity and type 2 diabetes look at these uh, uh, the the difference in the you can see on the left what the structure of the gut microbiome is in the obese mice you can see the firmitudes are much higher in in numbers but also i want you to look at the ratios the ratios of the bacteriodites to the firmitudes changes in the obese mice and in the lean mice so i talked about these ratios being important so uh, this was a study which showed that the ratios change not just the numbers in the obese mice in one of these experiments the uh, the microbiota from the obese mice was given to germ free mice and these germ free mice who received this this microbiota from the obese mice were given a diet which the lean mice had yet they exhibited increased body fat accumulation and the metabolic changes and this is suggesting the important role of the gut microbiota in increasing body weight and disturbing the metabolism similarly in cardiovascular disease it it affects the gut microbiome works through mainly three three system the pro inflammatory molecules the lipopolysaccharides that we talked about there are certain metabolites which are released and there are certain bioactive compounds like short chain fatty acids and the nitric oxide which influence bp and cardiovascular health when you look at this diagram when we eat certain foods the choline present in it is acted upon by the gut flora and this gut flora changes into tmba which is trimethylamine and then it reaches the liver where it is oxidized to tmao and this tmao uh, tmao 
increases the risk of atherosclerosis and platelet aggregation. And that is how the risk of cardiovascular disease happens through the gut flora. In diabetes, also, uh, the microbiota links are strong. The metabolism of bile acids, we talked about it earlier, they impact the lipid levels and uh, increase risk of diabetes. The fermentation of the dietary fibers and short-chain fatty acids, again, have the role in insulin sensitivity. And there are many gut hormones, their production and secretion, like GLP-1, PYY, they regulate the appetite and insulin secretion and thus glucose control. This is a diagram where when you have uh, on the left is the fiber-rich diet and you can see that the short-chain fatty acids are produced and the gut hormones PYY and GLP-1, which help in increasing satiety and motility, insulin sensitivity. And when that does not happen, you're on a high fat diet, the lipopolysaccharides, which eventually go on to the adipose tissue, liver, and increase inflammation and insulin resistance. So what can we do to restore this gut microbiota balance? Of course, diet, exercise, sleep, uh, setting our circadian rhythm. There's also some some uh, role of periodic fasting, which is being investigated. But the tools that help to improve the balance are probiotics, prebiotics, symbiotics, fecal microbiota transplant, and some herbs are being studied. I, I believe there is a study ongoing in the US where they are studying Chavant Praj to see how it changes the gut microbiota, and it looks like there are interesting results happening. So, how much time do I have, uh, Sheetal? Ma'am, we have another three, four minutes. Okay. So, these are uh, strategies to modify the gut flora favorably. And we know about probiotics, prebiotics, and symbiotics. I won't go into the definitions. But with probiotics... They are encouraging results, but I think the quest to find the precision, which strain, for what disease, that, that is something that is being precisely looked at. And here again, genomics and omics studies are helping us understand this precision. Uh, when we talk about prebiotics, we should not think that all fiber is prebiotics. And I just want to say that these prebiotics, they increase not only the short-chain fatty acid production, they increase the absorption of minerals as well. Generally, we associate fiber with decreasing uh, the mineral uptake, but prebiotics are known to increase the absorption of minerals, especially studies have been done with calcium, magnesium, zinc, and iron, very important and a big tool. And of course, they reduce the risk factors for the NCDs. Besides these, the postbiotics have come in the spotlight. And these are the molecules that come from the microbiome. And they are emerging as a new therapeutic approach to counter these metabolic diseases. And how these metabolites can produce the desired effect on health is being studied. And microbial enzymes are uh, emerging as the target for drug development. So if we have the enzymes and make them act in a way that we want them to, that can help. Symbiotics are also showing good results. This was studied in the SYNCAN study where anti-cancer properties have been showing good results. The probiotics generally used in symbiotics are Saccharomyces, Polardi, the bifidobacteria and lactobacillus species, and bacillus coagulant. And the prebiotics, the most commonly, most commonly studied and used is the fructooligosaccharides. Fecal microbiota transplant, also known as stool transplant, has shown very good results for the treatment of Clostridium difficile diarrhea, and it's more than 90% effective, which was taking the lives of small children. So just want to say that it's not just introducing a few strings. 
it is transplanting a whole new community and then that that community crowds out the pathogenic bacteria i i talked about how herbs are being studied there was another study in canada's mcgill university where they used a combination of probiotics a herbal supplement which is trifala which has avla bibitaki and haritaki it's you know fed to the fruit flies and again good results were seen uh, but i just want to say that this is in very nascent stages and whether this will translate into humans is yet to be seen so we can look forward to a more personalized approach to fixing this biosis and mining of the gut microbiota for the next generation of small molecules that they produce is is going to be uh the top research short chain fatty acids how important they are so studying their receptors and their signaling is very 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 crucial and that more work will happen in that area and we know that food is a useful tool for altering the body composition and the gut microbiome so that of course will stay so for the time being we can make our diets healthy by having less processed food more fermented the rainbow diet which we all know and we know that how important the gut is i said in my first slide that these are the most influential uh, gut microbiome so we need to understand them and uh, need to keep our diets exercise drugs etc we should be conscious of what we are doing so thank you so much for your patient listening